told the students, though, I was like, if y'all start crying now, we're going to dismiss really early and we'll go to lunch. So they said that they're going to start crying when they get hungry. So <laughs> whenever that is, we'll all start crying and we'll go to lunch. <laughs> uh, really, though, as uh, Pastor Chris asked me to share on our last Sunday here, and my first thoughts were, man, how in the world am I going to be able to do that? Uh, because, you know, two weeks ago, standing up here, it was so hard. I don't even, I've had some people tell me, I don't, we don't even know what you said, because fighting through the tears, it wasn't, didn't come out very clear. Uh, but I consider it an honor and a privilege to be able to share today, and I, and I know God's going to get me through this. Uh, but as I think of the last 15 years, I mean, all I can say is uh, thank you so much. Like, the overwhelming emotion I feel is gratefulness. Uh, it truly is. Uh, think back to, I mean, in 15 years, a lot happens, right? And uh, you guys, y'all are truly family. Uh, to Wave and I and Braden and Oliver, you always will be. I want you to know that. This, this will always be a most special place to us. And uh, you're not getting rid of us forever, I promise. I told uh, Pastor Chris even this week, like, I just, I don't feel like this is the last time I'm preaching at Benton's Crossroads. I don't look at it like that. So if I looked at it that way, maybe I'd be crying already. But I feel like the Lord's going to have us back uh, from time to time, and we want to be here as much as we can. Definitely don't want to be a, a hindrance to anything God's doing here, but uh, you guys are family. For 15 years, I can't just cut ties just like that. Uh, so we are just so uh, thankful for the past 15 years, all God has done, how encouraging and supportive you guys have been throughout, and uh, even these last two weeks. Like, y'all have been so loving and supportive and encouraging of us, and I'm not sure what I expected because I've never done this before, this transition, and I don't know, I told Wave, I was like, man, maybe it would be easier if somebody was rude and angry and mad, and so if you want to just throw something at me or spit on me, <laughs> maybe that might make it better today. <laughs> March of 2002, though, uh, this week as I prepared, I went back to, to that month. Uh, 24 years old, feeling like God was calling me into ministry, and I'm sitting in the conference room at Benton's Crossroads Baptist Church interviewing for a part-time youth minister position. It was so awkward. I still remember walking in. It was so awkward because less than two years before that, I was at Liberty University. I'd, I was getting my minor in youth ministry, but my advisor came to me and said, Darren, you need to take these two classes specifically their youth programming within church ministry, if you're ever going to be a youth pastor. And I stopped him right there, and I said, I'll never be a youth pastor. I don't have to worry about that. So I didn't take those two classes. I remember walking in. I'm like, man, I wish I would have taken those classes. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in and uh, sit down in that interview. I don't remember much as far as like who was there. I remember Will Crook was uh, a senior in high school. That tells you how, how long ago that was. Tell Will I was picking on about his age. Will's now married and two kids. Uh, but he was a senior in high school. He was like the youth representative on there. and They brought me on in April of 2002. I was part-time leading youth on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights only. And then eventually you guys would, would bring us on full-time in September of 2002. And, uh, you, you know, at a new job, most of you, rem you remember that first day on your new job? That first day, you always remember that. I remember setting up my office and getting it situated and then I remember walking upstairs and just praying over the youth room. And I can specifically remember, just like it was yesterday, looking out of that back window, out over the, the church playground, and I'm sure it was a bean field at the time. But I remember just saying, God, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Lord, I need you. Like, I need you to show me what to do, because I have no clue. Fifteen years later, I will tell you without a doubt, that's the best place any of us could ever be. Where we don't have a clue. And we're completely dependent on God. I felt that way. I was like, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I felt like he spoke very clearly to my spirit. And he said, love me and love them. And if you do those two things, I'm going to take care of the rest. And so Ephesians 3.20 it's a verse I've said many times, but it's a verse I don't take lightly. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. When I prayed that in September of 2002, I had no idea. I had no idea God would have me here for 15 years and, 
and stretch me and grow me and allow me to have so many deep relationships like we do. I had no clue when I was praying that, that he would allow me to stand here and preach so many sermons through the years, to allow me to stand here and speak words of truth and comfort to people and families who are going through some of their most difficult days of their lives at memorial services for loved ones. To allow me to stand here on days of joy and celebration when uh, I'd be able to officiate weddings. Many of those former students who I had seen grow up since middle school are now getting married. I had no idea he would allow me to baptize youth and children. Two of those, my very own sons, here at Benton's Crossroads. I had no idea he would allow me to, to be able to lead my first ever Lord's Supper. My first ever deacon ordination with Colin. None of that I could see in 2002, but God saw it all. And as long as I loved him and loved you guys, I'm a witness that he'll take care of the rest. You know, in 15 years, I'm going to be honest with you, you, you run around, you, you talk to different church leaders and different church ministers, and they always ask, like, where are you, Benton's Crossroads Baptist Church? How long have you been there? 15 years. What? Right? Everybody's, like, initial response is, like, shock, disbelief, because they think, well, youth pastors, they only hang around two or three years, and they bolt to something else. I've even had, through the years, some church leaders look down on me for staying at one place 15 years. It's the craziest thing. I didn't get along too well with those folks. <laughs> but there is this mindset with some people because there's this mindset like youth pastor is a stepping stone. And you're only a youth pastor because you want to just get some experience and then you want to be a senior pastor. There's this, that mindset like you're an assistant coach and you just everybody wants to be a head coach. That's not it at all. I believe without a doubt your calling is just as important and it's just as equal to my calling. My calling is with young people. Pastor Chris is to be a senior pastor. Yours may be to sit with kids in the nursery like she's going today. Yours may be to minister to widows, shut-ins, maybe children, youth, whatever it is. It may be music. But your calling from God is just as important. And there's, there's not this stepping stone. It's not like... That's not the way it should be in ministry. You know, we've, I've also heard people say, well, you know, you just, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go to a smaller church and then you're supposed to move on to quote unquote bigger and better things. Now, uh, Wava, she shared something on Facebook <laughs> about this, the way we feel about this, but this is probably one of the things that I despise the most because I don't, I don't agree with that at all. There is no bigger and better thing than serving Jesus Christ. No matter where you are or what you're doing. It doesn't matter if he gives you one person, 100 people, 100,000 people. There is nothing bigger and better. There's nothing greater than serving Jesus Christ. And so that's always been our heart. And you guys have known that. I've never seen this as a stepping stone. I've never seen this as let's go on to bigger and better things. This is the biggest and best thing serving you all for the past 15 years and so like climbing that ladder, ladder of success I remember one time I preached and I had a ladder actually over here some of y'all may remember that that's never my intention it shouldn't be yours either it's not about climbing a ladder of success to get people to notice you to, so that you can have power and prestige and popularity that's that's not it I'll say like if you're busy climbing that ladder of success you're going to pass Jesus very, very quickly. Because Philippians 2 makes it clear that he's at the bottom of that. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. He wasn't holding on to that. Hey, look at me. I'm God in the flesh. Everybody bow to me. He wasn't about that. But he took the very nature of a servant. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, the worst form of punishment, the worst form of humiliation at that time. And so God has taught me so much in 15 years that, hey, the way, the way you show me to others is just humble yourself and serve. That's what it's all about. So here's the thing, family. I give you my permission and my encouragement that if any time in my future, I don't care where I am, Lee Park, wherever, if you feel that I'm getting off course there, you're my family. You have my encouragement. Call me. Call me out on it, okay? 
Because it's not about Darren Adams. It's not about me climbing any ladder of success. I want to stay humble, and I want to stay serving him. All right, so why go to Lee Park? Why go to Lee Park and why now? Three words. Just being transparent with you. I don't know. <laughs> Told someone that this morning. Living a life by faith is very scary. We know that. I can't see the big picture. I don't know why God's called me there. I can't see that. You and I can't see the things that God sees. This has been such a difficult process of trying to seek Him and discern His will and His and listen to his voice. And it's been scary. Like there's times where like I just I didn't want to leave. And I told God that. God, however you want to block that door, you can do that. That was one of my prayers. But through it all, gradually God's speaking to my heart saying that it's time to go. And I've got to trust that. So why leave part why now? I don't know. Maybe God will reveal that in his time. I'm sure he will. But what I want to do today is, is try to help you all, because I'm sure you're, you're going to be faced with big decisions in your life. You want to know the will of God. Like if I ask, how many of you want to know the will of God in your life, the will of God for your life, probably every hand would go up. But then if I asked, how many of you know without a doubt that right now you are fulfilling God's will for your life? I believe less, less than 100% of the hands would go up. This is something like we all want to know. We all want to know God's voice. We all want to know his will. But sometimes it can be difficult to figure out. And so as I go there today, I want to start out, though. I talked to the youth a couple weeks about this. But what's some of the best advice you've ever been given? As you think back, like, do you remember a time where somebody gave you a piece of advice and you held on to it and it was, it was so helpful at the time? I wrote down some of these things in my Bible here. Never take yourself too seriously. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. You will be measured by the way you impact others, not by what others think about you. Don't set limits on your expectations. There's nothing you and God can't handle together. Problems come, and I've said this one before, problems come when you start to think everyone thinks like yourself, because in reality, no one does. Everyone's normal till you get to know them. What about, have you ever been given a good piece of advice and you didn't follow it for whatever reason? Maybe you just decided, I'm going to do it my way, or you didn't really trust it, and you decided to do things different, and it didn't, didn't work out very well. I think of two like, little small things, but our first semester at college at Clemson, my twin brother, he's here, don't, don't confuse us, he shaved his head, so it's pretty easy to <laughs> tell. That's not me. I'm not going to go in the bathroom after church and shave my head. I'm scared it won't grow back. Uh, <laughs> but our freshman year at Clemson, somebody, I think it was an advisor, told me, don't take 8 a.m. classes that, that first semester. And now I was thinking, why not? Like, I'm used to high school, and, I mean, we always take 8 a.m. classes. What's the big deal? And they said, you know, you got baseball, you're going to be weight training and running, and you're going to be really tired and really sore, and it's, you got mandatory study hall for freshmen that doesn't even end until like 9.30 every night. And I'm like, ah, that's still a ah, big deal. And I get there, and, uh, you know, you realize that people don't even go out, like, socially till like, 10 o'clock. And so, like, you start doing the math. I'm not going to have much sleeping time. And Brian and I, we still joke about it. Miss Rice, a freshman English. Now, Miss Rice was nice. Thank goodness, nice rice. But, uh, I can still remember her, like, making fun of us. She's like, come on, Adams boys, y'all can stay awake. Come on, you can do it. Because there would be many classes, 8 a.m. I'm not sure why I showed up, because I would be asleep within 20 minutes. That's terrible. Don't do that. Okay? Listen to advice. Three weeks ago, Wave and I and the boys, we were in Florida on vacation. And uh, Wave and I were at the beach one afternoon just by ourselves. And we were just standing there as the waves were coming in, just watching people. And there was this one little girl, 
uh, specifically, I, she's probably four or five years old, I'm guessing. Tiny little girl, and uh, she was standing there, and I brought some props here. I want to show you what she was doing. She had, uh, now these are like adult size, but they might have been a little smaller. She had a boogie board in one arm, just like this, and then she had her float, her raft, just like this. And she would walk, try to walk out in these waves, and every time it would just hit her and, like, knock her down. She was having a miserable experience at the beach. Now, her mom was right there, and her mom kept encouraging her, Honey, just sit in the raft. Just hold on. The, you, you know, you'll be good. You'll float over it, and you'll have a great time. She would not listen to her mom whatsoever. I mean, it was like the devil came out when her mom tried to. If her mom tried to go, she'd go, ah! She tried to take it. I mean, she was, it was crazy. Wave and I were sitting there, and you couldn't help but laugh because as parents, we've all been there before, right? But she would not listen. As much as her mom wanted to convince her, you're going to have a great experience if you just sit in this or just float on this. She had to do it her way. And it was miserable for her. As Wave and I got to talking, though, when we were standing there, we thought, Man, how often are we just like that with God? God calls us to something, or he wants us to change something. He wants us to give up something. He wants us to pursue something. And let's be honest. Eh. No, God, not ready, don't want to. That's off limits. Don't want to. In John chapter 2, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to summarize it. But I believe, I told the students, like the best advice ever is written in one verse in John chapter 2. And y'all know uh, that story. It's Jesus' first miracle, uh, the wedding at Cana. Jesus, his brothers, his mom, his disciples, they're all at this wedding reception. And y'all know the story. The wine runs out. And Jesus' mom, she looks at him and says, they have no more wine. Now, I think that's interesting to start with because had she seen miracles before? Because this is his first recorded miracle, but I got to think she probably had seen some before. She knew, like, his birth was a miracle. She knew of his teaching. She, she knew of his wisdom. She knew of his sinless life. So I had to think she probably saw a lot of other stuff that nobody else saw. And so, like, she looks at him like, they have no more wine, expecting him to do something. And what was his response? He was like, woman, why do you trouble me? My time hasn't come yet. And now in typical mom fashion, she doesn't even go there. She doesn't even engage in any of that argument. She just looks at all the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Which I believe is the greatest advice ever given. Do whatever he, Jesus, tells you to do now these servants we have to assume they didn't know jesus they're faced with this opportunity do we do it do we just listen to what this guy tells us to do or we just try to figure it out and hey you go get on the horse and buggy or whatever they had and go <laughs> go get some wine they decide to listen to jesus and you know the rest of the story he tells them to go fill up these six stone pitchers stone jars of water Fill them up full of water, and then the water's turned to wine, the best-tasting wine ever. Church, I just say, like, that's where I desire to be. And I hope that's where you desire to be as well, to where you're ready to do whatever he tells you to do. Like I said, for us in this journey, like, it hasn't been easy at all. When I started to feel like he was telling me to do that, I wanted to run. I wanted to not listen. I wanted to be more like Jonah, or maybe even Gideon, questioning things. So what I want to give you is, is just three things throughout this process that helped me. And they're going to sound basic, going to sound very simple, but I hope they will challenge you spiritually, wherever you are in your relationship with Christ. The first thing that I did through this process is seek God first with all your heart. Now, I know that sounds simple, and, and we say that, but it's not often easy to do. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
And it doesn't mean seeking God just to get an answer. There's a difference. It doesn't mean just seeking his hand and what he can give us, what he can provide for us. But it means seeking his heart, seeking his face, seeking to know him more, to listen to him and what he may have for me and for us. John Ortberg says that we'll never experience the guidance from God we are seeking if our main goal is just to get guidance from God. Does that make sense? In other words, if our goal in approaching God is just to, to use him to get a quick piece of advice or to get something that we want from him, then we're going to miss out on the most important thing in that personal relationship with him. I don't know about y'all, but I've done this so many times in my life where my prayer life is just about me and just, God, give me this, do this, I need this, I need help with this. And like I've told our students, sometimes we can treat God like this almighty vending machine in the sky. God, I put in my request, I wanted Cheetos, and you gave me cheese puffs. I don't like cheese puffs. That's true, I don't like cheese puffs. But uh, sometimes we can be like that, with God, like, God, I need this, and I need it now. I asked for it, I need it now. And then when we don't get it, when there's a delay or something else comes, what do we do? How do we handle it? See, if you have this type of faith, I believe the way you determine if you have this type of faith is how do you respond when things don't go your way, when you don't get the answer that you want? It's really difficult. See, God's main will for our lives is the character development of who we become. Psalm 37, 4 tells us, delight ourselves in the Lord. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. We want those desires of our heart, but it's kind of hard to always delight ourselves in the Lord. So how do you delight yourself in the Lord? The first thing that I believe we have to do is to get into his word. We have to know like what he wants to speak to us. I thought about it this way. You've heard it, but like if you got a letter in the mail, if I got this letter, it says to Darren from God. If this came in the mail. What am I going to do with it? Am I just going to like throw it in the trash? Am I going to put it with all the ads and all the junk mail? No, like of course. I'm be like, God wrote me a letter? What does it say? I'm going to open it up and I'm going to read it. And what I believe is that God has written us a letter. This is it. This is it. So that we can have the best life possible. He's not out to make our life boring and miserable. He's saying if you follow this, you'll have the abundant life. More than you could ask or imagine. So what is the result of seeking God with all your heart? John 10, 27 says that my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Seeking God with all, all of our heart. Getting into his word. Seeing, I believe he'll teach you like as you read. He'll bring out things that you're reading, but he'll also bring out other things that you may not even be reading. He'll speak to you that way as well. And of course, through prayer. Over these last few months, I've met with a lot of trusted Christian mentors, friends, brothers in Christ that know me. But you know, the most important things is, is knowing his word, getting in his word, letting him speak to us that way and through prayer. The second thing, after seeking him first with all my heart that comes with it, is complete surrender. And now this is even harder, because complete surrender is just that. It's everything. Now, we like to sing, like, I surrender all, but if we're honest, like, how many times is it more like, I surrender some, I surrender some, some to Jesus, some I give him, some I surrender. Don't ever sing again, she says. <laughs> okay, that is one thing y'all never asked me to do here. David Platt once said, one of the biggest temptations of Christians is that we like to try to set our lives up so that if God does nothing in our lives, then we'll still be okay. In other words, it, our greatest temptation is for us to build and care for our own empire, to take care of ourselves and handle things on our own in case God can't, won't, or doesn't step in. This is the opposite of surrender. Surrender is scary, and it's such a process. Like, I go back to this little girl at the beach. Like, I hope we left, so I don't know what happened. I hope she got to a point where 
she was able to surrender and listen to her mom and, and float and have a great time at the beach because otherwise she left and she's probably never going to want to go to the beach ever again. I wouldn't. That was a miserable experience for her. But surrender, like, even when it's tough, even when after 15 years you feel like God is saying, surrender this church family to me that you love so dearly. Surrender the student ministry to me. I can't look at them. When he says surrender uh, coaching baseball at Metro Atlanta Christian Academy, which you all know I've done for the last 10 years. Give all those things to me and trust me. That's hard. It's those crisis of belief moments where you're like, are you sure, God? But that's what it means like to walk in faith. Charles Stanley says this. He says the best piece of advice he was ever given when entering into ministry, someone told him, he says, whatever you do in life, always obey God fully. If he tells you to run your head through a brick wall, go forward expecting him to make a hole. That's faith. That's the faith, though, that I see in Scripture of our forefathers. Complete surrender. You have to know these folks were faced with, with crisis of belief moments. It wasn't easy for them. And then the third thing is full obedience. See, I believe the predetermined answer to God should be yes. Yes. As we surrender, like no matter what he says, we got to say yes. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And that we can be confident in this, that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. See, just like we can't surrender some, we can't just obey partially. I believe partial obedience is disobedience. I believe that it's not up to us like just to take God for a test drive and see like, do I like this? And if I do like it, I'll continue. And if not, I'll stop. Like part of me thought that way. I was like, man, I mean, this is crazy. I'm just being transparent. Like, what if I could just go to Lee Park and see if I like it? That's not what God wants. God wants complete faith and surrender even though may not make sense, and even though it against, goes against a lot of your feelings. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Bottom line is I, I've come to a point to realize that you really can't fulfill God's true will for your life if you're, not afraid, if you're afraid to step out in faith, because it is risky, and it is going to cost you something. But he says it's going to be worth it, and so we trust him in that. I want to close with a story, though. I'm going to summarize it from Scripture, a story that you've heard many times, but I believe it'll tie in kind of where, where I'm at right now and what I feel like God's doing in my life. It's a story of a prophet of God from the Old Testament. Now, a prophet's main uh, role here is to seek God first, hear from God, and then speak God's messages to his people. Sounds great, right? Seek God, listen to God, tell others about him. This guy, his first assignment, though, was very rough. God was telling him to go to the king and queen of the northern tribes of Israel, that's Ahab and Jezebel, and let them know that they were in sin. So I want you to go to the king and queen, tell them they're sinners. What do we know about Ahab and Jezebel? The Bible says there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by his wife Jezebel. So these are two really evil people, and uh, God, you want me to go tell them that they're sinners, and they're living in sin. As you can imagine, this did not go well for Elijah the prophet. Uh, he quickly found himself running for his life. They had a bounty out for him. They wanted to kill him. And he's hiding, the Bible says, in a place called the Kareth Ravine. Picture a wooded setting with a little creek running through it. That's where he is hiding out for his life not knowing what in the world he is going to do. But the Bible says something miraculous happened is that God started to provide daily through birds, through ravens, who would come and they would bring him food. And he had water there at the brook that he would drink daily. And so I want you to see, like Elijah 
was in this awesome place of complete dependence on God. I mean, it was like a child who's dependent on his or her mom daily for food. Elijah couldn't do anything on his own. And so he's seeing God supernaturally provide. He's understanding how powerful God is and how God will make a way even when it doesn't seem like there's any way at all. He's learning all these valuable things and then something terrible happens next. The Bible says the brook dried up, the creek dried up. There was no more water. The birds stopped coming, no more food. So what does he do now? Has God just left him here, abandoned him? Has God given up on him? Where was God in the midst of this? All right, God, you have been taking care of me. You're just going to cut it off? I guess I'm going to die. And then God speaks to him. He says, I want you to go to a widow's house in the village of Zarephath. And there she's going to take care of you. Now, what we got to understand about this is that a widow in this day and age was the poorest of the poor in society. Whatever picture comes to mind today of poorest of poor in, in our society, picture that. That was, that was what a widow was in that day. So don't picture like God sending Elijah to a country club or a mansion or even middle class. He's saying, I want you to go to the poorest of the poor to this village called Zarephath. And guess whose hometown was Zarephath? Take a guess. Jezebel. God, the brook dried up, and you want me to go to the poorest of the poor in the most dangerous place I could probably go. Why would God do that? Again, to see what Elijah's response was going to be. Are you going to be totally dependent on me? Are you going to surrender everything? Are you going to seek me? Are you going to obey fully? And Elijah does. And as he goes to the widow's house, she takes care of him. It was through all that that days later is when God would lead Elijah up to Mount Carmel. And there on Mount Carmel, we know God showed off his power in amazing glory. Y'all know the story, right? God showed up in power and, just, and in fire and just took over that altar and in front of the Baal prophets. But what I want you to see, church, is that Elijah had learned like complete dependence he had learned complete surrender and full obedience no matter what. I believe he knew God was going to show up in power on top of that mountain because he knew God had provided for him at the Kareth Ravine. He knew God had provided for him at the widow's house. And so even though it didn't make sense, I believe that's why he had the faith to go up on top of that mountain and start pray. God, just show up, show off, your power and your glory. And it happened. Church, I just say, like, that's, that's where I want to be, doing whatever he tells me to do, and completely dependent on him. I feel kind of like I did 15 years ago, going to Lee Park. Like, I feel like I don't have a clue what I'm doing. But as I told you, I believe that can be the best place possible where we're totally dependent on him. So what do I want people to remember about me here? Again, it's not like I'm going forever. But as I've thought of this past week, like people, y'all aren't going to remember all my awesome sermons, <laughs> all those wonderful points. It took me hours to prepare. Youth, y'all aren't going to remember those hundreds and thousands of lessons, probably. But what are you going to remember? My prayer is that you remember that initial prayer in 2002. That we, you have seen Wave and I love God and love you all to the best of our ability. That's the gospel. That's what it's all about. I wanted to try to read a letter Wave wrote, but maybe Pastor Chris, you can read that at the end to the church. I won't be able to get through it. Hebrews 11.6 has become my life verse. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's where we're at. Trying to live by faith, even though we can't see the big picture, even though we don't know what's next. We love you all. We always will. And we'll be back some. Oliver's already asked me, like, can we come back for special events and stuff? I certainly hope so. I told him, I I don't think they'll throw any rocks at us. But I want to make a promise to y'all so that I'm going to keep praying for Benton's Crossroads. And I pray God does awesome things here. I pray that you know of the Holy Spirit's power. Let me pray. Father, just get us all to that point, Lord, where we just are completely dependent on you. God, you are fully worthy of all of our trust. I don't know why we worry so much and we doubt and we fear. Lord, you've never let us down, though. God, teach us and remind us, uh, Lord, as we just examine our own lives, just how as we look back and see how you have provided for us, God, that your, your past provision is still the best indicator of your future blessing for our life. God, you're going to take care of us. Just as you did Elijah when he didn't have a clue what was going to happen. Lord, I thank you for this church family here. And uh, Father, in many ways, it it seems surreal that 15 years has just flown by. I'm so grateful and so thankful for the privilege to be able to serve here. And Lord, I know that this always will be my family. Uh, Father, I thank you for the love, the common bond that we share. And that's because of you, Jesus. And so, Jesus, I ask that you would just pour out your blessings upon this church. Lord, that you would do... Uh, greater things than even anyone could ask or imagine here at Benton's Crossroads. Uh, Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All
States Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling We'll come to the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Who come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness I can do this. This is the saying that you won't remember what people say, but you will remember how they make you feel. It's so true. I will never forget what it felt like when you showed up at our apartment with moving trucks to move us into our current house. I was nine months pregnant and could hardly move myself, let alone all of our belongings. Then you gave me a baby shower. People who did not even know me came to give my child gifts. I wept after that shower because I had never known that type of unconditional love. You've continued to love my boys by teaching them about Jesus and caring about their lives. These are the things that will keep people coming to Benton's Crossroads along with the Holy Spirit. Please pray for me as I will continue to pray for all of you for more love and for more of God's Spirit. I love you all. Let's give this family a hand. Amen. We are